Good evening, sir. Greetings from Guwahati. Uh, I'm Dr. Anudriti. Yeah. So I would like to start my presentation on recurrent pregnancy loss. Can everyone hear me, please? Yes. I'm a consultant gynecologist at Pratiksha Hospital, Guwahati. I'll just start the slideshow. Uh, the definition of recurrent pregnancy loss, as we all know, is the three or more consecutive pregnancy losses before 20 weeks gestation. But now this has been changed to two or more consecutive losses according to certain guidelines. The reason being the risk of further loss is similar for both two versus three consecutive losses, and the initiation of evaluation is definitely appropriate even after two losses because depending on what the patient's age and the desire is. So five percent of the couples who are attempting pregnancy have two losses, and you have one percent couples have three or more consecutive losses. So we could consider RPL even if the losses are not consecutive. What is a sporadic consecutive loss different between an RPL? Now a sporadic abortion, unless a successful pregnancy incre uh, intervenes, increases the risk for the next pregnancy loss. And there is a distinguishing, distinction between these two are very blurred. Now as an effect of the maternal age, the sporadic risk definitely increases almost by 50% as the woman ages to more than 40, whether it's a uploid or an unuploid loss. So what is a primary uh, recurrent pregnancy loss? A primary recurrent pregnancy loss is a one who never had a viable pregnancy. A secondary is a previously delivered pregnancy beyond 20 weeks and then she suffered subsequent losses. And a tertiary RPL is multiple miscarriages which has been interspersed with normal pregnancies. Now the etiology, as we all know, is multiple, but 50% of which is unknown. Mostly it might be a genetic and anatomic, it might be an autonomic, autoimmune, infectious, endocrine etiology. So the anatomic etiology could be a congenital one or an acquired. The congenital could be a malarian anomaly or a congenital incompetence of the cervix. The acquired could be a cervical incompetence, it could be a neutroencynechia, a leomyoma or adenomyosis. Now these uh, 10 to 15 percent of the recurrent tram uh, first trimester losses, they do have some part of congenital anomaly. Septic comprises a loss of almost 25 to 90 percent and these can be resected with the help of hysteroscopic septum resections. Then we have biconvid uterus which also leads to the loss but the benefits of a surgery in biconvid is doubtful. We have in uniconvid uterus almost 50 percent and we have a very good outcome with uterine didelphus and then congenital DAS exposures, cervical incompetence, and sinecki. Now, the relationship between a uterine myoma and RPL is doubtful, the, uh, the, is given, but then the connection being large fibroids definitely distort the uterine cavity, and they occupy a large endometrial area, so there is a mechanical obstruction, or they may be affecting the placentation of the fetus. Now, infective agents, uh, there is no role of torch, toxoplasma, cytomegalovirus infection in the case of RPM. There might be roles of bacterial vaginosis caused by organisms like urea, ure urealized lyticum, uroplasm, which may cause second trimester pregnancy losses, but these are again doubtful. Now, genetic factors, uh, we have very commonly, if we do a parental chromosomal rearrangement, we have a balanced translocation which is common, either a reciprocal or a Robertsonian uh, translocation. And 50% risk of pregnancy loss is there in case of genetic factors, but eventually these may produce a normal offspring. So genetic factors is usually more effective for prognostication of the condition. Now, the embryonic chromosomal abnormalities have 25 to 50 percent uh, in the miscarriage tissues in the RPL, if we do the tissue examination. In case of sporadic miscarriages, the very common conditions which are found are autosomal trisomies, monosomies, and, uh, and polyploidies. Now, these are again genetic conditions are associated with the increased maternal age and the risk of euploid pregnancy increases the subsequent risk of miscarriages. But there is always a better prognosis for subsequent and euploid pregnancies, the chances are much better. 
And once we hear a fetal heartbeat, then we know that the risk of aneuploidy comes to less than 5%. So, other genetic factors is a very important thing is the advanced maternal age. The impact on the risk of pregnancy loss cannot be overemphasized here. And definitely the increased risk of trisomies as we all know. This is probably because of the natural selection of a better quality oocyte becomes in an earlier age than in the later reproductive life. Plus the oocytes recruited in the later life are more likely to be abnormal or they have more biotic errors. Thrombophobia, thrombophilias, another cause. We know that pregnancy itself is a hypercoagulable state and women may have heritable or acquired thrombophilic disorders which significantly increase the risk of pregnancy losses. Now, these can be venous thrombophilic or arterial. In the venous thrombophilic, we have heterozygous factor V latent deficiencies, prothrombin mutations and hyperhomocystinemias. And in the acquired, we have antiphospholipid antibodies, activated protein C resistance, hyperhomocysteinemia, and other possible as protein C, protein S deficiency, antithrombin deficiencies, and elevate, elevated factor A. In the arterial, we have hypersomohomocysteinemia, APLA, uh, and lupus anticoagulant. But for thrombocilias, there is no robust data which is giving a direct communication, direct connection between the RPL and uh, the thrombophilia. But these are again more common in cases of second trimester miscarriages. They are more common. And ACOG does not recommend a routine screening for thrombophilias. Luteal phase defect, the incidence in RPL is almost 12 to 25, uh, 20%. Sorry. The causes of luteal phase defect, hypergrupalactinemias, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, polycystic ovarian syndromes, pure ovarian reserves, even in cases of stress and exercise, it's been seen. And the theories which they are saying why luteal phase defect can be a cause of recurrent pregnancy loss is because they lead to poor follicular development, decreased progesterone production by the corpus luteum, and then dysfunctional endometrial response to the secreted progesterone. But again, LPD, as we know, RPL, everything is a controversy in RPL. Now, LPD, again, they are saying it's controversial because there are studies which has shown that 80% of women with, old, with very low mid progesterone proceed up to term and then 20% of fertile women will have abnormal endometrial biopsies uh, even though they are well fertile and the progesterone level can also keep changing. Now for the endocrine factors we poorly control diabetes, patients with overt hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism overt and there is no evidence that asymptomatic systemic endocrinologic or metabolic disorders may be a cause of RPM and then Autoimmune disorders associated with pregnancy losses, SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, and which is mostly in the first trimester loss, 10% risk, second and third trimester SLE causes almost 6% risk, antiphospholipid syndrome, it's 38%, it's a cause of 38% in second trimester loss. Now the antiphospholipid antibodies are autoantibodies recognizing the various combinations of phospholipid, which are or phospholipid binding proteins. And this syndrome is clinical correlation association between the APL and the syndrome of hypertrophicability. So for APL to be diagnostic, we need clinical features and laboratory features. In the clinical features, a history of vascular thrombosis, a lot of loss of fetus at or 10 weeks of gestation or preterm delivery at or before 34 weeks of gestation or three or more consecutive abortions before 10 weeks of gestation. For the laboratory features, we need anti-cardiolipin antibody positive, IgG, IgM at moderate or high level, which are on two or more occasions and this has been six weeks apart and the lupus anticoagulant antibodies which have been detected on two or more occasions six weeks apart. Now the other antibodies which are not directly associated with RPL but we give is anti-nuclear antibodies which is more common in women with RPL and anti-thyroglobulin and anti-thyroid peroxidase anti-TPO antibodies are also markers of increased risk of pregnancy loss even if not RPL, they've been identified in early pregnancy loss patients. Now the LO immune factor, another important cause, is the immune response to the non-self components of pregnancy. So the body is reacting either through cytotoxic antibodies, there's an absence of maternal blocking antibodies, there's inappropriate sharing of the HLA, and there's been the disturbance in the natural killer cell function and distribution. The cytotoxic antibody is the maternal response to these paternal antigens and these are also seen in 
fertile couples than those with more with apical couples. Now, blocking antibodies is the theory basically is the maternal anti-fetal antibodies which block the maternal cell mediated response. They otherwise, if not, these will go and hit the fetal tissue and cause fetal rejection. So these blocking antibodies have been found to be less in RPL patients. Now the natural killer cells activation they increase the rate of abortions and high natural killer cells have been found in patients with uh, RPL. So HLA incompatibility in couples and then as I said the absence of maternal leukocytic antibodies natural more natural killer cells and the cytokines a T helper cell increase T helper cell one versus a T helper cell two. Because T helper cell 1 is basically leads to overproduction of cytokines that leads to deleterious effect on the fetus. That is the T and the ratio between these two alters. Besides the environmental factors play a major role in the RPL etiology. So there has been a confirmed association with ionizing radiation exposure, organic use of organic solvents, alcohol, mercury, lead, suspected associated with use of more caffeine, hyperthermia, fever and cigarette smoking unknown association with pesticides. So, but uh, come what may out of everything, more than 50% of the couples with RPL have no explanation despite any all these evaluation. So informative and sympathetic as tender loving care is very, very important while counseling these patients. And ultimately 70% live birth rates are reported in these couples with unexplained RPL who undertake untreated or, uh, you know, go into subsequent pregnancies. So for the evaluation, the history, I'll go quickly, the pattern and the trimester of abortions, when it occurred, how it occurred, at what trimester, was there any exposure to any particular toxin, was there any obstetrical infection, or was there any feature of previous antiphospholipid syndrome. So for all patients, it has been advised that we have to go for a HSG. If, uh, if we sign any abnormality, go for a hysteroscopy. The lupus anticoagulant, APTT should be done. Anti-cardiolipin antibody should be done. The thyroid profile, prolactin, testosterone, hemoglobin A1C, glycosylate, hemoglobin 2R, PP insulin. And then karyotyping of both, both the parents and if possible after the second abortion, even the abortus. And these for selected patients, we could go for uh, hormonal imbalances are seen, androgen estimation, serum progesterone, even dating of the endometrium, serum homocysteine levels or the thrombophilia screen, not done routinely, and then uh, the vaginal swab test and even a semen culture because it's been sound that they are also causes of and uh, uh, RPL. And finally, as I said, the role of tender loving care and well counseling of the patients would help her go through this process of trauma, of having a recurrent loss. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anujitri. Thank you so much for being there today with us. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you, sir. Yeah, it was so nice presentation. And Thank you, uh, finally, yes, the role of tender loving care comes in yes, the picture sir. and all this... Uh, has to be noted by all of us that we as a doctors have to be very patient and try to understand psychologically also apart from yes, prescribing sir. them drugs and medicines this is very yes, important sir. that we treat them as a patient as full full patient rather than just uh, you know giving them uh, these drugs so i would yes, like sir. to thank you madam for your wonderful lecture now thank i call upon so dr nebanita uh, das uh, madam are you there Nabhanita Deka, madam, are you there, please? Yeah. So it is a it is a very good thing that you have come and today we are having Guwahati and uh, Shilong with us. Uh, I I request uh, Meenal to please show the slides. As you are aware, uh, this is Pan India and many people from abroad are also watching us. And I have to tell you that Guwahati is the gate of East India, from where you enter Assam, then you yes, enter, sir. that's what I want to tell. And then we go to the whole of Northeast, I can see all of you, and I would like to thank Dr. Alakananda Das and uh, Dr. Nabanita, she's been kind enough to hold this uh, program. But I want to tell our audience that what is Guwahati? Guwahati is basically a wonderful place, as you are aware, and this is what we find the pictures here. It is so nice. 
and the most importantly basically the name guwahati is from arika nut if i'm uh, right madam is it right yes yes sir <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a big metropolis city it is has it has got skyscrapers and can we have the next slide and the most important is basically the kamakya temple and it is yes, uh, from the shakti peethas of uh, you know where the law, uh, goddess parvati is uh, Yoni, or that's what they say, is yes. uh, fallen down at the time when this uh, issue occurred with Shiva, and that is how you can see the Brahmaputra River, the greatest uh, river which is there, and uh, it is situated at the banks, and there is the plateau of uh, at the Shillong Hills. So this has got history of several thousand years, and in Puranas it has been depicted. and it is such a beautiful place i had the opportunity to be there in guwahati on 1st of november 2009 and uh, it is one of uh, uh, you know having lot of astrological significance also there is an astrological temple of navagra there is uh, a hill which is nilachal hill chitra hachal hill it has been found actually in 7 uh, in 2nd century bc so we are very thankful to you madam that all of you have joined and the history is very big but some another day we will surely catch up with the history and with this wonderful lecture of yours we will now visit another beautiful place that is none other than shillong it is so lovely madam indrani roy you are so so humble and so generous in your hospitality we remember we landed up there on 2nd november and east zone your foxy was there and it was such a wonderful i got such a wonderful memories madam but then we will show after your lecture dr indrani roy you are already uh, uh, you know the, the pillar of shillong society and uh, we would appreciate that you would start your lecture with this and then we will go further later thank you so much Thank you, sir. I am audible, I suppose. Yes, yes. I am audible. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir, Viranjan sir. It's so nice seeing all of you here, and I really thank you for uh, giving the Shillong Society the opportunity today to come forward in this webinar. My sincere yes, thanks to our president, uh, uh, our president uh, Umlong Madam, and our secretary Kapil, who has given me this opportunity to speak today. So should I start? Yes, ma'am. Please. Just one sec. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So I welcome all of you to the Scotland of the East, Meghalaya. and uh, a, a small a short video for for a small memory of you sir uh, when you had visited uh, chilong yes madam madam please lower your screen so that your full face is seen please just lower your laptop screen yeah little bit like this here yeah. is it okay yeah yeah thank is you is it so okay much. sir Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, so yeah. you'll remember those beautiful memories, sir. Okay, thank you. So we had a great uh, experience hosting the East Zone Eva Foxy. So I'll yes, come to yes, my yes. presentation now. Yes, yes, yes. So I'll be talking on management of RPL with low molecular weight heparin. So I think this uh, my previous speaker has already gone through this definition wise. It's three consecutive losses of clinically recognized pregnancies less than twenty weeks of gestation, and we rule out ectopic molar and biochemical pregnancies in these conditions. The investigations should be started after two consecutive spontaneous abortions, especially if the fetal heart rate has been already identified before, and if there has been a prior pregnancy loss. women who are older than 35 years of age and if the couple had any difficulty in conception the few sub types one is all pregnancy losses with no viable pregnancy viable pregnancy which are followed by pregnancy losses and pregnancy losses interspersed with viable pregnancies so primary recurrent pregnancy loss refers to couples that have never had a live birth 
while secondary RPL refers to those who have had repetitive losses following a successful pregnancy. So incidents, uh, mostly 50% of all conceptions, they are mostly unrecognized failed pregnancies and 30 to 15% of recognized pregnancies which are lost out of this 90% occur before 12 to 14 weeks and 10 to 20% of pregnant women have at least one sporadic spontaneous abortion. 2% have two consecutive spontaneous abortion and the rate is for three consecutive spontaneous abortion is 0.4 to rate 1%. Now a single spontaneous abortion then unless a successful pregnancy intervenes, increases the risk for the next pregnancy. And distinction between sporadic and recurrent loss is a little bit blurred. And uh, maternal age has a big uh, impact. So age above 40, uh, the risk approaches almost around 50%. So if a woman has had a previous one live birth, then her risk is around 12%, which increases with 24% with one loss, 26 with two losses, 32 with three, and um, it's almost as high as 26% with four losses. And those women who have had no live births, two or more losses, it risk is around 40 to 45%. Now, uh, the etiology and risk factors have already been discussed. They might be uh, uterine, immunologic, endocrine, genetic, thrombophilic, or environmental causes. Now, thrombophilia and RPL, almost 40 to 50% of RP RPL cases are related to thrombophilia. And uh, pregnancy, as you all know, we all know is a hypercoagulable state. And this can worsen by thrombophilia because there's impaired blood flow leading to placental clots and that results in fetal growth restriction and fetal demise. Now, what are the etiologies of thrombophilia? They might be venous or arterial. So venous, most commonly inherited are heterozygous, that is factor 5, factor 2, uh, hyperhomocysteine. Uh, madam, uh, can you please uh, share, yes, share the screen? I think uh, we need to uh, love to you to uh, share the screen. There is a green button, share screen. And so, you're sir, you are not being able to see? No, no, we, we are not able. I, at least I can't see. Manish? There is a... Anudhirti, can you see? Anika? Sir, so uh, so just... So you are being able to see? No, you will have to press the share screen. You will have to sir? show your slides from your side. Yes, sir. I, I have shared the screen, sir. Yeah, but uh, I would I would uh, like to ask the other panelist and speaker. Can you see the slides? No, we can't see the slides. We yeah, can so Meena, can you share the slides so that uh, then Madam will speak on that in case. Yeah, now you have started sharing. Sir, so, yeah. can you see yes. now? Yes, yes. Now yes. we can. Oh, uh, you have missed the previous slides, sir. Yes? No, it's okay. We have understood. Just I was telling you. I thought uh, probably. Okay. You want to start again? You should. Well, there's some problem with the. Now we can. Sir, have you seen the Shillong video or not? Have you seen your no, picture? No, 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 no. You can start again. I'll, no? I'll show that in the last. So I'll show you. I'll show you. Show show that in the last after I finish sure, with sure. my presentation, Thank sir. Thank so you. I'll continue from here. Yes. Should yes. I continue Etiology. from here? Yes. Yes. Etiology is thrombophilia. Yes, madam. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Please yes, continue. Yes, I'll continue from here. Yeah. So the previous ones were a little bit. Uh, the voice is breaking actually. I don't know. The connection is so unstable. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? We can, yes. hear you. we can hear you loud and clear. So, okay. So, I'll continue from here, sir. Yes. So, uh, uh, etiology. Thrombophilia. So, I'll continue with the etiologies from thrombophilia. So, they may be arterial, where we have hyperhomocysteinemia. Then the antiphospholipid antibodies, lupus, anticoagulant. Sir, it is clear now? Yeah, yeah, very clear. Hello? It is, is it clear? It is very clear. It is very clear. Please continue, madam. Okay. Please continue. Oh. Okay. Okay, sir. So then we have the factor five deficiencies, prothrombin mutations, hyperhomocysteinemia with polymorphism morphomisms, then antithrombin deficiency, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency. Then for autoimmune factors, we have systemic lupus erythematosus. Uh, first trimester losses ranges up to 10% risk. And second and third trimester, the around 6% loss. 
Then we have the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Here, the second trimester loss ranges up to 38 percent. Three or more consecutive spontaneous abortions before 10 weeks. Then we have the anti-cardiolipin antibodies, the IgG and IgG at moderate or high levels. This has to be test tested on two or more occasions, at least six weeks apart. Then the lupus anticoagulant antibodies. This also they have to be detected on two or more occasions, at least six weeks apart. Now we have other anti-phospholipid syndromes. This might be anti-phosphatidylserine. These are nearly always associated with uh, anti-phospholipid, highly correlated to the cardiolipin binding. Then we have low levels of APL are not associated with RPL, and the assays for this non-ACL APL are not standardized. So these uh, studies are so far very contradictory. Then uh, a low immune factor. Some immune response to non-self components of pregnancy can occur due to cytotoxic antibodies, absence of maternal blocking antibodies, inappropriate sharing of HLA, disturbances in the natural killer cell function and distribution. So what is the ASHRAE requirements uh, for 2017 guidelines are for women with RPL screening recommended for hereditary thrombophilia unless in the context of research or in women with additional risk factors for thrombophilia. So, but uh, for women with RPL, screening is recommended for antiphospholipid antibodies, both IgG and IgM, if there are two pregnancy losses. Now, coming to the anticoagulant therapy, heparin. So, the, what are the actions of heparin? Heparin is inactive by itself as an anticoagulant, and it requires the presence of plasma cofactor antithrombin-3. Now, heparin potentiates the action of antithrombin-3, the heparin 83 complex neutralizes the actions of factor 2, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. It binds to lysine sites on the antithrombin 3, leading to confirmation change at the arginine reactive center. Now, heparin binds to saturable sites on the endothelial cells, and it is internalized and depolymerized. It displaces the platelet factor 4 from the endothelial cells, a protein that neutralizes heparin. Now, this action of heparin and is modified by fibrin and platelets. The fibrin is a clot bound fibrin. It binds to the thrombin and protects it from the inactivation by heparin antithrombin 3. And then the platelets, they bind the factor 10A and protect it from heparin antithrombin 3 complex inhibition and by secreting platelet factor 4. Subendothelial thrombin is also protected from heparin antithrombin 3. Now, what are the adverse effects of heparin? If you see the side effects, uh, these are dose-related. If there's major bleeding, it is definitely dose-related. Thrombocytopenia is also dose-related. Thrombosis also dose-related. Osteoporosis, anaphylaxis, it is not dose-related. Even with the starting dose, we might get anaphylactic reaction. And there are uh, little uh, rare with uh, skin necrosis, urticaria, and hypoaldosterone. These are little rare side effects. Now, heparin induced so thrombocytemia. Uh, there might be two forms. There might be mild reduction in platelet count, two to 15 days after initiation of full dose heparin therapy. Platelet count usually remains above one lakh. And then we might have a severe reduction in the platelet count that might be seven to 14 days after initiation of therapy with full dose or low dose heparin. They may be associated with thrombotic complications including arterial thrombosis with platelet fibrin clots that may cause stroke or MI. Presence of antiplatelet IgG in patients with severe form of disease may be less common with uh, heparin which is used for por porcine heparin. Now the laboratory monitoring APTT is the most important test. It is routinely uh, done by monitoring APTT and the clotting time of 1.5 to 2 times the normal with APTT value between 50 to 70 seconds is therapeutic. So it should be initially, if you start therapy, it should be measured and then you adjust the infusion rate accordingly. And once a steady state is achieved, then daily monitoring is sufficient. Now resistance to heparin, some patients may show a prolongation of APTT unless very high doses of heparin are used. Presence of an increased concentration of factor VIII will give rise to a very short controlled APT and they may not be truly resistant to heparin. Uh, accelerated clearance of heparin may exist as in the cases of massive pulmonary embolism. Then there might be inherited antithrombin-3 deficiency, which are 40 to 60% of the normal plasma concentration of antithrombin-3. 
Then we have the acquired antithrombin 3 deficiency as well with hepatic cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, or DIC. For managing over anticoagulation, now if anticoagulant effect of heparin disappears within hours after this continuation of the drug, mild bleeding due to heparin can be controlled without administration of an antagonist. Antagonists are used only if the bleeding is life threatening. So, what is the management of over anticoagulation? It depends on the degree of over anticoagulation or presence and absence of bleeding. So, what is the heparin antagonist? We use protamin sulfate that is 25 to 50 milligram intravenously, and the side effects are largely allergic in nature. Now, recommendations for clinical use heparin is the anticoagulant of choice in pregnancy because it does not cause the placenta, no untoward effects on the fetus or the newborn, given in the therapeutic doses. And um, doses in excess of 20,000 per 24 hours for more than two to five months is questionable due to risk of osteoporosis. Now, coming to the low molecular weight heparins, anoxaprinol, daltaparin, they contain a lower proportion of the critical pentacyclic sequence than the parent compound, and they increase the action of antithrombin 3 on factor 10A. So these low molecular weight heparins are not inactivated by platelet factor 4. Therefore, activity depends to factor 10A bound to platelet membranes. In clinical doses, no effect on platelet reactivity, prothrombin or APTT. Currently, this is approved for prevention of DVT. And it is used even after hip or knee surgery or unstable angina. So what is the advantages of low molecular weight heparins? They do not require routine monitoring of INR, PT or APTT. One fixed dose administered subcutaneously. They must not be administered intramuscularly and is not intended for IV administration and they should be used in caution with patients with a history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. This is again reversed by protamine. So here's a comparison of uh, unfractionated heparin versus low molecular weight heparin versus fondaparinux and um, all are reversed by uh, protamine sulfate. And uh, the dosing frequency is uh, uh, for unfractionated heparin, it is a continuous drip, whereas it is for low molecular weight heparin, it is a BID or once daily dose. So these uh, both can be used in pregnancy. So the advantages of low molecular weight heparin is it has a longer half life, a greater bioavailability. It's a more stable dose response relationship. It's only once daily administration, requires less frequent monitoring. And it has less adverse effect on the bone mineral density and platelet count. Hence, more attractive than unfractionated heparin. But there have been very few randomized control studies to compare both the results of uh, low molecular weight heparin versus unfractionated heparin. And the monitoring also for unfractionated heparin, um, uh, this is uh, the both APTT equal to 1.5 to 2.5 times the mean control PTT, it suggests the reduced risk of thrombolism. So monitoring is of choice. You might not as well. So what is the treatment guidelines for use of anticoagulants in RPL? According to ESHRAE, for women with hereditary thrombophilia with history of RPL, we suggest not to use antithrombotic prophylaxis unless in the context of research or if indicated for venous thromboembolism prevention. So there are certain categories here. So uh, there are three categories, basically. One is like conditional, where, the, the, where there is a um, uh, double plus, single plus. There is a chart where, where you will uh, you can decide uh, the strength of recommendation is high uh, or the strength of recommendation is low. But for women who fulfill the laboratory criteria of antiphospholipid syndrome and a history of three or more pregnancy losses, so the suggestion is administration of low-dose aspirin starting before conception with a prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin starting at a date of positive pregnancy test over no treatment. Here the condition is single plus. So the guideline development group suggests offering anticoagulant treatment for women with two pregnancy losses and antiphospholipid antibody only in the context of clinical research. Now, what does the RCOG says? Here also, uh, according to RCOG, there have been some trials which have, uh, uh, they have come to the conclusion that uh, uh, it, 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 the benefits are if you are using low-dose aspirin along with uh, low molecular heparin, comparatively, if you see, the results are almost same as compared to only aspirin. And uh, there's another study here, but here, uh, this study is uh, from uh, Healthy UK. 
and here they have uh, come to a conclusion where that they have seen an increase improved live birth rate with uh, if they have used low molecular weight heparin those patients who are presented with two or more uh, recurrent pregnancy losses and here the results were a better chance of live birth with low molecular weight heparin now what is the cochrane say regarding this uh, combination of heparin plus aspirin during the course of pregnancy may increase live birth rate in women with persistent apl when compared with aspirin treatment alone but they have raised this point that more research is needed in this area in order to further evaluate potential risk and benefits of this treatment to gain consensus for prevention of rpl thank you i think that was all i'll just uh, go through the previous uh, 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 which uh, sir uh, for this is specifically for chavan sir you have missed uh, this I, this i want to play this specially for you sir oh thank you this was missed so beautiful shila i want to show the pictures of beautiful shila uh, thank you thank you madam lovely and you remember the time you spent in shillong during ezon eva foxy yes yes madam how can i forget so beautiful this is dauki lake i want there oh my god yes yes oh <laughs> thank so, you sir so you have already shown thank you so much thank you madam so you thank members, you sir the patrons of tog webinar welcome all of you today we are at north east part of india they say that north eastern region of india is commonly and popularly known as the seven sisters and we all know the seven sisters is basically the paradise unexplored and today we are in guwahati assam and shillong and it is this region of arunachal pradesh assam meghalaya manipur mizoram nagaland tripura and sikkim and that is the reason it is the most beautiful part of the india i think kapil and manika mandeep indrani and nebanita deka madam and even datta madam will agree that you are such a wonderful people such a beautiful place and it's such a mesmerizing photographs are there of you so we are that opportunity dr komal and myself and there were about foxy foxy in about 30 40 of us we had come and it was an honor that we could on senior me nepanita deka and alakananda das madam did on 1st of november and 2nd 3rd 4th we were in uh, shillong so basically it's a the entry point where we enter the north east region and uh, and most famously is the kamakya temple which i described and i want sana to share some slides so that i also want the viewers to know what i captured so this is the beautiful kamakya temple you can see and it is one of the pithas one of the pithas shakti pitha where parvati is yoni is there and that's what they worship and it's more commonly seen that the infertile patient the infertile couples they come here and when they pray they are bestowed with a child that's what is the ancient uh, uh, thing which is there but we as doctors we practice medicine and uh, we are having this big heritage and the ancient culture of india which is the part of this can i have the future slides for the slides so basically this is how it looks how it looks when we when we took a picture from shillong at the don bosco center and this is the famous lake which is there please this is the lake another lake which we have seen at the uh, point of shillong and This is the famous Dauki Lake, which is at the border of India and Bangladesh. This is Dauki Lake in November 2019, Meghalaya, at the border of Bangladesh and India. We see inside the rocks a clear crystal water. This is the first in Asia, and the second one is in Croatia. So, madam, we had a wonderful time. I am also sharing these beautiful pictures, and I, yes, I already 
in your dress ancient and this was a view point khasi hills we went all the way to dauki lake two and a half hour journey it was such a wonderful uh, view myself dr bipin pandit dr komal dr uh, pradeep uh, i mean we call him dr only pradeep palshetkar and we were there to show the few glimpses of the we is on your foxy such a wonderful place madam that you give us the opportunity oh my god i can't believe this is a picture which i took and i just uh, you know thought that i should share with the, our patrons of tog webinar and it's like visiting shillong it's visiting guwahati such a wonderful beauty place uh, shillong is known as actually for the scottish cloth and uh, we already know that this cloth is used for making the jackets frocks and other items and it's very famous for its gardens manicured gardens yeah this is the picture with our president madam dr nandita palchetkar you can see dr pk shah and uh, indrani roy madam is already there thank you next e zone you are foxy i would like to thank all of you this was the picture which we took of the don bosco center <coughs> the views of shillong and we find here dr rishikesh pai our our debonair president of elect president elect of foxy 2021 we had that opportunity this was a famous picture i thought uh, i should share with you and again with this picture we had some wonderful time and guwahati and uh, shillong was very good so thank you all of you we have this boundaries you can see brahmaputra river and the seven sisters being there bordered by bangladesh nepal china on one side and it's a very paradise unexplored place it is basically made up of many tribes different tribes they have got different huts and they are amazing people we heard those dances so thank you madam we should go back to the discussion now and uh, we will go ahead with the question and answer session so i would like to start the question and answer session with uh, dr datta dr datta are you there so dr datta please unmute your mic so that we can go ahead and see can you hear me sir yes okay yes so we will start with the session uh, madam you have explained very nicely the presentation on rpl i want to know from you what are the various treatment options and pregnancy outcome in women with idiopathic recurrent miscarriages dr datta yes sir sir there have been various treatment modalities which have been suggested can you hear me sir yeah yeah we can hear it's so loud and clear yeah so there have been various treatment modalities suggested and uh, most of them have been using all kinds of uh, uh, treatment modalities and they are all stressing on the thromboprophylaxis part especially in cases of idiopathic recurrent miscarriages so thromboprophylaxis they are also using enoxaparin uh, mostly low, as dr indrani said low molecular weight heparin and then we have been using combination drugs so folic acid we use very frequently and then aspirin and progesterone the fact that i'm stressing on aspirin sir because aspirin is a drug which is cheap easily available it can be administered very easily and so it can be administered easily and its patient acceptability is also there now aspirin has its own antiplatelet effect and it also promotes a balance between the immunomodulation where the prostacyclin and the thromboxin balance can be uh, modulated by aspirin so it has been recommended to okay. start aspirin and so uh, if prednisolone is added it also gives an anti inflammatory effect and so okay. and most importantly progesterone so as we all know we are all using progesterone uh, for recurrent pregnancy loss patients it has been seen that it has a good effect not only on the luteal phase endometrium it also gives an embryo stability and it also has a neutrine crisis effect so progesterone is also giving so combination of all these drugs so can be used and uh, along with uh, low molecular weight happen as and when indicated for management and proper outcome of these cases thank you uh, dr datta it was a wonderful explanation which you gave thank you so much uh, dr indrani roy uh, 
you have given a wonderful lecture on low molecular weight uh, but in the meantime i just visited shillong and you also visited shillong so it was yes. a uh, break from your uh, presentation which you have covered but there are viewers who have joined uh, later on also so for their benefit i we would like to ask how effective is low molecular weight heparin in improving the live birth rate in these patients who have got more than two or uh, you know recurrent pregnancy losses especially when it is unexplained so will you please uh, highlight on this yes sir so uh, i have already explained uh, the usefulness of low molecular weight heparin in unexplained pregnancy loss yes definitely there is a role more so when uh, the consensus says that when there is an uh, uh, anti phospholipid antibody syndrome if it is positive then definitely the uh, low molecular weight heparin along with aspirin will give you a better live birth result than aspirin alone Um, so, uh, but uh, uh, certain studies uh, uh, also say that uh, one or two studies have also seen that the both uh, with aspirin along with low molecular weight heparin, the results are almost same. So, most important it is the clinician who has to decide uh, 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 whether the uh, the results of low molecular weight heparin will give a positive outcome or not. But definitely, the consensus says that yes, live birth rates are more if you use both in combination if the antiphospholipid and Antibody syndrome is positive. Okay, so nicely explained. Yeah, there are various studies also which have been there by Fauzi et al. who has yes. uh, given in gynecol obstetric in 2008, where the treatment options, especially by low molecular weight <coughs> idiopathic recurrent miscarriages. So there are very old papers also, and we have got recent uh, papers. I remember Dr. Badavi, Ahmed Badavi, who had come uh, last year, and we had hosted him. uh he also gave a wonderful lecture on recurrent pregnancy loss he is an authority and his uh, also uh, paper on low molecular weight heparin and uh, in recurrent early pregnancy miscarriages was also published in the journal obstetric gynecology 2008 so thank you so much now we go to dr manika agarwal please unmute your mic uh, can you listen to me uh, should, uh, yeah so the question is madam should thrombo prophylaxis be given throughout pregnancy in women with previous history of recurrent miscarriages of unknown etiology what is the take what is your the take the studies which have found as we have already discussed that on search of literature many studies have shown promising results in terms of life birth rate with thrombo prophylaxis and in these cases generally aspirin can be started as soon as uh, the pregnancy test is positive and as far as inoxaparin is uh, considered they have found that it should be started after fetal cardiac activity has been initiated and should continue till around 34 to 36 weeks of pregnancy and anyway because the critical period is already over so continuing it throughout the pregnancy till 34 to 36 weeks of pregnancy has been recommended in literature okay so nicely explained thank you so much now we go thank to the sir. next uh, uh, dr mandeep Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, the question is, what treatment do you suggest for APS positive women, and uh, when to commence the treatment? What do you recommend the dose, and how will you uh, go ahead with the prescription? Yes, uh, in the case of <coughs> antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, where where the situation causes increase uh, antibodies, which causes more coagulation, uh, increase risk of coagulation in the system in the patient, we suggest. Uh, low dose aspirin and low molecular weight heparin and in random in randomized many randomized control studies they found that if we use only low dose aspirin the chance of low uh, live birth rate is only 40% but if we use both low but uh, low dose aspirin and along with low molecular weight heparin uh, sorry yes uh, they, the the live birth rate is 70% it increases to 70% and also uh, the by using this combination the pregnancy loss is also decreased by 54%. So if we want to start with uh, aspirin we should start it at the when the when when the pregnancy is confirmed by doing a pregnancy even even test even pregnancy test and then the low molecular weight heparin should be started when as soon as the cardiac activity is noted in the embryo by doing an ultrasonography and it should be continued till um, till at least 34 weeks if there is no history of thrombosis. And recent guideline also suggests that uh, this one, the ecospin can can stop it at 36 weeks of gestation, and uh, this one low dose heparin 
to do the separate can be continued till the time of delivery uh, if we it uh, uh, if we plan for induction or cesarean section it should be stopped at least 24 hours before the uh, time time of delivery or cesarean section or induction and then after delivery normal delivery uh, from uh, six, 6 hours after normal delivery or the 12 hours after cesarean section it should be again started for at least 6 weeks postpartum in order to prevent uh, uh, this one uh, deep vein thrombosis or it, it, it has been uh, then we should stop it for 6 weeks okay. the dose okay. the, the dose and and the dose the dose of heparin should be uh, around uh, 5000 to 7000 5000 5, to 10000 uh, unit subcutaneously twice daily or you can also use low molecular weight heparin uh, around 40 um, uh, inox like inoxaparin 40 mg once daily and then aspirin we use we use 75 mg to 100 mg low dose which causes inhibition of platelet so this way we can uh, prevent yeah. return premature loss in anti postpartum syndrome okay. thank you thank you doctor uh, so nice of you to give this uh, insight about use of uh, heparin and aspirin in APS syndrome and now we go to Dr. Driti Datta can you clarify on low molecular weight used in women with inherited thrombophilia so in cases with inherited thrombophilias uh, according uh, to the Sir American College of Pharmacology they do not uh, suggest use of uh, low molecular weight heparin uh, for the thrombophilia cases as Rilwani Bhai had enumerated earlier. But we have RCOG guidelines which have recommended the use of antenatal low molecular weight heparin in asymptomatic patients who has got homozygosity sir, for the factor 5 laden and prothrombin deficiency and these guidelines recommend use of low molecular weight heparin. But as such sir, for hereditary ACCP guidelines they do not recommend use of regular use of prophylactic uh, low molecular weight heparin. Okay. So there are various studies also. Dr. Laura Armasher has done management yeah. of inherited thrombophilia and pregnancy. This was published in the London Journal of 2016 where yes, basically this is how uh, the clarification is there on low molecular weight use in women with inherited thrombophilia. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And it, yes. And it has shown beneficial effects Effects when uh, it is used. So, sir, so CLT recommends, but okay. uh, there has been a difference in opinion. In both okay, okay, okay. Uh, fine. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gatta. Now we go to Dr. Indrani Roy. What is the effectiveness of using natural micronized progesterone in women who are undergoing ART? Yes, uh, luteal support, uh, support in ART pregnancies. This is important for implantation, embryo transfer, and to improve the pregnancy rates. Yes. So, luteal cell deficiency definitely it can occur when we are using um, GnRH agonist or antagonist for control ovarian stimulation. So, here definitely there is a role of progesterone and uh, progesterone in any form. You can use uh, natural micronized progesterone or digrogesterone to maintain the luteal support. Definitely, I would recommend that it should be used. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, madam, what would be the dose and which route you would prefer? Because Indians, you are aware, uh, they are little uh, not so happy with the vaginal route. But in ART, what yeah. do you suggest? Uh, ART pregnancy is also vaginal progesterone can be easily given. If the patient is compliant, definitely they are natural micronized progesterone. 100 milligram progesterone tablets are available. This can be given per vaginally. Okay, yes. So there are various studies also which say that you can give 100 milligram and it has been approved in 37 countries and I appreciate your answer and this take on uh, use of uh, micronized uh, progesterone in undergoing treatment for ART. Now I come to Dr. Monica Agarwal. Yes. Uh, how different is the oral administration when compared to the vaginal progesterone especially in this... Uh, supplementation of the luteal phase support. What is your take on this matter? Okay, as far as luteal phase support is considered, we know that the kind of progesterone that we are using for this purpose is either micronized progesterone or digestron. Now, micronized progesterone is a preparation which can be used either orally or vaginally. And literature supports that the bio uh, availability of vaginal progesterone is more than the oral progesterone. But the problem with vaginal progesterone is it can cause irritation and obviously it is not very patient friendly and most of the women will not like to take it. 
तो इवन द बायो अवेलेबिलिटी थ्रू वजाइनल प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन विल बी बेटर दो इट इज नॉट सो पेशेंट फ्रेंडली और कमिंग टू ओरल डिटर्जेस्ट्रॉन इट हैज फाउंड टू बी एज इफेक्टिव एज वजाइनल माइक्रोनाइज प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन एंड इट इज ऑल्सो पेशेंट फ्रेंडली So, if given a choice, we can give oral dietrogestrone, and uh, preferable is vaginal uh, micronized progesterone because of the uh, bioavailability. If it is comfortable for the patient and she is compliant. Okay, uh, Doctor Mandi. Now, uh, already the RPL lecture has been taken by Gatta. So, I would like you to uh, you know establish uh, and try to. Make our viewers who have just joined later on. Uh, what are the tests for diagnosis, and how do you recommend for RPL? So let us uh, do the diagnosis part, and the treatment part. You can explain it later. For diagnosis part, we should always start with a history, uh, an examination. Then we should, uh, should do the with the intersection. So history, you should you should look up. Now we should find out whether there was any history of instrument, intrauterine instrumentation. Like DNC, and also we need to know the time, time of gestational age. At what at what gestational age the uh, uh, abortion has occurred, and also the genetic and family history, the presence of consanguinity, uh, the marriage, and then uh, also presence of like electoria, and then in examination we should look whether she is overweight or not. Then uh, his presence of hirsutism, electoria, and then it will this these things will give us some hint regarding what kind of Uh, what kind of uh, diagnosis we, uh, cause we might find in RPL? Now the test that we suggest uh, is um, mainly uh, three or four, actually, and uh, basically, first we need to find out whether there is any intrauterine abortions uh, due or malign um, anomaly in the uterus. By doing, we uh, can do a 3D ultrasonography to find out, to uh, to define to, to find out if there is any malign anomaly in the uterus and to define it between septal uterus and Iconic uterus, and then we should also do sonor sonography or hysteroscopy to find out if there is intrauterine adhesions or the submucous myoma. At the, while while doing hysteroscopy, we, at the same time we should also do the resection of the subsepal septum or in, any intrauterine adhesions or submucous myoma, and we should also look out for cervical incompetence. And then we should also look out for uh, immunological factors. My cause RPL, especially the anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome. We should look out for the three um, antibodies like lupus anticoagulant, anti-cardiolipin antibody, and beta two glycoprotein type type one protein. Uh, along with that, we should also do a uh, parental chromosomal biotaping uh, to look out for any variance translocations. Like um, which, this is common in two to five percent of the couples, but. That can cause repeated chromosomal anomaly in the fetus and repeated pregnancy loss. So this should be looked after. And if if we get any balanced translocation, this should be offered genetic counselling. And also, they can be offered IVF and pre pre implantation uh, genetic diagnosis, uh, so that healthy embryos can be transferred to the for implantation. And then we should also look for any endo endocrinological abnormalities like hypothyroidism, any thyroid disease, hyperthyroidism, or antibodies like uh, thyroid antibodies. Uh, anti TPO, and then we should also look for hyperprolactinemia, and in PCOS, hyper insulin, insulin hypersense uh, uh, resistance in PCOS, like that we should look out for uh, the cause of RPL. But in 50 percent of the cases, we do not get any uh, definite cause of RPL. And okay. so, according if we find the cause, then we can treat, uh, give the treatment accordingly. In anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome, we give uh, low dose aspirin along with heparin, unfortunate heparin or low molecular, low molecular weight heparin to prevent uh, the uh, to maintain the pregnancy. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Doctor uh, Datta. Would you like to add here something? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, he has mentioned antiphospholipid. I mean, everything depends on the kind of uh, etiology which has caused the uh, RPL. And uh, he has uh, so one thing. I would also like the product of conception examination yeah. can be done, sir. So product of conception, if it is comes and you apply, then you can just leave it because you know there is a good chance of having a proper pregnancy. 
Now, if there is the products of conception come euploids, I think that is when the whole RPL uh, set has to be started. And even the parental chromosomal testing can be done at that particular point. So after two abortions, so it makes sense to check the products of conception as well. So that is important. Sir. Wonderful. Wonderful, madam. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mandeep. You had uh, wonderfully explained your done uh, on the diagnosis of the uprine factor and antiphospholipid syndrome. There are endocrine anomalies, genetic environmental factors like you know, when you smoke or drug use, excessive alcohol, yes. caffeine also will affect to a lot of extent uh, to the RPL. And obviously, you have explained about the other uh, factors which are not that much important, but they are to be mentioned and uh, rightly you have done a wonderful job. Uh, Dr. Datta, can I come back to you with uh, uh, the question of women presenting with clinical diagnosis of threatened miscarriage? Does the use of natural micronized progesterone reduce the rate of spontaneous miscarriage? Yes, sir. Definitely, the use of natural uh, pro natural micronized progesterone has uh, reduced the rate of spontaneous abortion, sir, and, and even the, in cases of threatened abortion. So not only micronized progesterone, we are also using a lot of diprogesterone in cases of threatened abortion nowadays. And so there have been studies which have shown, even in Cochrane, they have studies where they have studies they have shown use of progesterone versus patients who have been given placebos and then patients with no treatment. And they have found out that the results by using that progesterone has definitely been much higher. So the success rate in pregnancy, sir, is definitely higher in threatened abortion cases once we use progesterone. As I said, progesterone not only so helps us to maintain the endometrial stability, but it also has a very good anti-inflammatory action which helps helps us to, you know, overcome the miscarriages which occur, especially in the first trimesters. So, so definitely it makes sense to use nat naturalized, micronized progesterone to avoid uh, threatened abortions which goes into spontaneous abortions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, madam, I would also ask you one more question by Dr. K. K. Chaudhary. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, his uh, questions are uh, three of them, but I would take only one. If torch test is indicated uh, in rubella IgG level and if it is high, what treatment do you suggest? Sir, in case it is IgG, then the, I would not do anything. Sir, so torch yes. test is like a tombstone. You can just forget torch test. Now so, IgG... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I am just saying because in a presentation I had given it like a tomb. So, so we normally do not advise, especially in cases of IgG, nothing has to be done. So you can just leave it and rest assured that patient will not be having any problem with the torch positive IgG. Uh, Dr. Chapala Patovari, uh, yes. Madam, this question is also for you. What is the role of ecosprin? Obviously, uh, aspirin and all has been, but it is for preconception period of RPL. Sir, as has been said by, I think, Dr. Mandeep very well, that aspirin can be added from the preconception period when you have a history of APL, APL syndromes, and uh, continue it. And as soon as the patient starts having cardiac activity, we can start putting her on low molecular weight heparin as well. But definitely, there is definite role of adding aspirin in preconception periods in patients with recurrent pregnancy loss who are planning, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. Now we come back to the question, uh, Dr. Indrani, Madam. Uh, madam, uh, one more point. Yeah. The role of aspirin regarding patients who are uh, having a high risk of developing preeclampsia, these patients really benefit from actually low dose aspirin. Yes, yes, yes. Start yes from definitely. Early. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, in Vaniba, we are actually doing in the first trimester screening, the preeclampsia the screening is done and we are even giving high doses also. Now they have said it in the fetal medicine yes. we have forearms that you can add aspirin 150 milligram as well. 150 milligram. Yes, 150 milligram is recommended, sir, to prevent preeclampsia and PIH for the future in the pregnancy. Madam, for our viewers' benefit who had uh, missed this uh, presentation, I would like to ask uh, Indrani Roy. Uh, can we combine low dose aspirin or low molecular weight with oral micronized progesterone in patients with recurrent early pregnancy loss? And does it uh, improve the live birth rate and lower the miscarriages, madam? 
Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, this has been already been said before, and I'm still repeating again. Definitely, uh, progesterone has a big role to play, and there have been uh, some studies. Uh, I, I think it's quoted Sir Fauzi has done one study also where he has uh, had the combined treatment of progesterone along with aspirin or low molecular weight. Definitely, they showed that there was an increase in the live birth rate. So definitely, progesterone can be used in combination with. Aspirin or low molecular weight heparin, which will give a better outcome for live births. Thank you, thank you, madam, for uh, again taking that question because uh, there are viewers who join again yes, and, uh, for their benefit. We have to answer the questions. Uh, Doctor Sanjan Wala is with us. He is from Mumbai, and madam, I want to tell both of you from Guwahati and Shillong. Today, Mumbai is like northeast. It is like Shillong. It has been raining since last two oh, days. Yeah, and it is such a beautiful weather. And I am so lucky that I am feeling right now. I am sitting in Shillong in Guwahati. So it is such a nice of you people to be there with us, Dr. Kapil. Would you like to say something about uh, the webinar? And I am very happy that you. And Indrani, madam, I have taken that uh, extra effort along with uh, Nebanita Deka, madam, to make this presentation and webinar a successful uh, presentation today. Doctor Kapil. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, sorry, I was a bit late because I ha I had a COVID duty. Yes. So that's why. Sorry for the delay. Uh, I would like to thank. Uh, Everyone, uh, Madam uh, Arun Dutty Ratta, uh, Doctor Manika, Doctor Indrani Roy, and as well as Doctor Mandeep for wonderful presentation. Uh, it was very nice, and as well as uh, Sir Doctor Chauhan Sir, thank you so much for giving us chance to present Northeast at okay. national <laughs> national uh, platform, Sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely, and I called you up and. Uh, You were both of uh, the societies were so kind enough, and uh, we sorted out within a period of ten days. And thank you for your efficient, uh, uh, you know, management of getting Dr. Manika, Dr. Mandeep, Dr. Indrani, and uh, Dutta, Madam. You just joined yesterday. Yes, so, sir. <laughs> so, so nice of you, Madam. Was yes, a little sir. busy, but uh, you all have given a wonderful uh, time to all of us. There are few questions which are there. I will just return to Dr. Sanjanwala. Dr. Sanjanwala is a very senior gynecologist from Mumbai, and uh, nowadays we are missing the actual meeting in the conference where we get up, stand, ask the questions. So he is one of them who is very curious, very inquisitive, and we thank him that he is still sitting in his uh, Jew, uh, you know, place home, and he has asked a question: Does Uh, what is the dose of aspirin and low molecular weight heparin? And you decide it on what basis, whether it is on the maternal weight, and uh, whether the dose is same for a 50 kg and a 125 kg weight patient. So, Doctor Dutta, please throw the light. I think so. Indrani Baba would be a better choice because we Indrani Baba. <laughs> yeah. We've been using high dose. In any part, any part. Uh, see, like uh, uh, sir, what you have said that for a uh, weight uh, uh, according to the for an aspirin, if you have a 50 kg woman and a 125 kg, so what would be the dose of both aspirin and low molecular weight heparin? Something, something. It's a Uh, very tricky question. Yes, <laughs> if you go by uh, if you go by theory, definitely uh, weight weight will have an impact absolutely. on the dosage. If you go by so in that theory, that we will increase the dose from five thousand to further ten uh, thousand. Sir, may I add on something? Okay. Yeah, yeah, Anita wants to add. Yeah, sure. Yeah, actually, since we have a department, we have been debating on this. Ah, yes, Traditionally, we have been using low dose aspirin, 75 milligram, irrespective of the age, which was being recommended by all the bodies. Very recently, when the thought of 150 milligram came in, we went into it and we found that there is only one Western study. It is not a guideline where they use a dose of 150 milligram, and it has been carried out on European population. 
and 800 uh, patients were given uh, 150 milligram of aspirin vis a vis control and they showed some benefit in terms of preeclampsia. In fact, I have seen in, uh, I think so, Indian Journal of Ox and Gynae, where in KGMC, they were doing their own studies of 75 milligram aspirin with a vis 150 milligram. So, I don't think so. In Indian population, we need to adopt 150 milligram uh, for this purpose or we should do our own studies in Indian population where in patients predisposed to preeclampsia, in some patients, we start 75 milligram and in others, we start 150 milligram because their body weights are generally more. So this was a very recent study and you know Europe is now reeling with obesity problems. So none of them they have taken into consideration uh, per kg body weight. So this needs to be studied better that should in Indian population should, we should adopt 150 milligram and I believe we should do studies on this as was being done in KGMC where we take some equal number of population and we do 70 milligrams with a 150 milligram and see if it is beneficial in our population and we should not just accept things in few studies which are given uh, unless we do our own randomized control trials. Just one more thing I want to add. Uh, yes. Here, uh, I, I think I want to quote Dr. Pankaj Desai, sir, here. He has done an extensive rich research on RPL and preeclampsia, eclampsia. And I have gone through uh, one of his literature uh, things where, and his lectures also, he has strongly recommended that for predict patients who have uh, have the chance of developing preeclampsia, definitely 150 milligram aspirin has a big role to play. So I think uh, studies are required but uh, since coming from a stalwart like Pankaj Desai sir I think we, we, we can adapt this as 150 milligram for certain patients looking at the risk factor analyzing the case and then definitely yes and even the fetal medicine foundation of India sir is uh, advising 150 we are going by the fetal medicine foundation of India our sonologist who has been a member of that so he has been advising 150 milligram based on that sir so, Dr. Sanjanwala, Dr. Sanjanwala, you have got the answer, 50 milligram, 150 milligram for 50 kg and 125 kg. I think that's wonderful and uh, you have been all kind enough to be there. There are a few questions uh, which are there and there is a product which is available, enoxyparin, which is more uh, being uh, there. You can utilize this, especially as a low molecular, no, low molecular weight parent and the benefits which we have already talked. Now there is one more question. What are the follow-up investigation needed when we start uh, the molecular uh, low dose heparin? This is Dr. Monica Gupta. So what are the follow-up things which will you be doing? Dr. Indrani Roy, can you highlight on that? So, sir, I didn't. Sir, I was not there. Sir, sir, once more time, can you get the question, please? Yeah. Uh, investigation. Indrani, uh, Indrani, madam. The question is by Dr. Monica Gupta. Yes, sir. Asking, what are the follow-up investigations which are needed when we start, when we have already started a low molecular weight heparin? How do you follow up with this patient? So we have to uh, 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 the uh, APTT and all has to be measured. Uh, prothrombin time uh, definitely this will give us an idea uh, if uh, there is a hyper overdosage of the drug so if the uh, 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 time is prolonged then definitely we need to think that there might be uh, she might go into a, a, a state where there might be overdosage of the drug so the, the these factors should be monitored okay. yeah yeah do yes yes so the literature, as per your own uh, slide, said that uh, we as clinicians sometimes are scared, but the literature says that at least with low dose uh, heparin, molecular heparin, sometimes the risk of bleeding is so less and it does not require monitoring. So this is what the literature says. So when I had put my own patient on enoxaparin, you know, uh, frequently just to be on the safer side, I got these uh, APTT, PT done, even though the literature was suggesting that uh, nothing needs to be done and I realized it was not required also. So but for the first time or the second time you're putting the patients, you would like to build up your own experience. But uh, the literature suggests that the chances of bleeding are very, very minimal and uh, these uh, monitorings are generally not <laughs> required. The dose of enoxaparin which has been used generally is 40 milligram uh, subcutaneously. But in some studies, they have also used 20 milligrams subcutaneously, which has been found effective like with the live birth rate of 81%. 
secondly what is also important is we have to teach the patient how to administer enoxaprine herself by lifting up the anterior abdominal wall and making uh, giving this injection which is very safe and it is not very difficult also yeah thank you uh, so much dr monika and monika uh, sir yeah thank you thank It's you guys monika monika yes so uh, to uh, concise briefly basically we have recurrent miscarriages which occur in 1 to 2% and uh, more than half of all this miscarriages the cause still remain uncertain there is lot of uncertainty but thrombophilia has been identified as one of the main important cause and where you have to need of giving thrombo prophylaxis where well, that's what an option is been uh, said by dr manika if i'm not mistaken right yeah that's yes sir yeah. yeah so madam all of you are great i would like to now acknowledge uh, the guwahati society i would also like to acknowledge the shillong society president secretary that you are so kind enough and all of you dr nebanita deka dr indrani roy dr kapil and uh, our speaker dr anu driti datta dr manika agarwal and mandeep to be today here in rpl along with the whole india and the indian peninsula we have also uh, you know members being here from nepal and other countries which are there nearby and i am very grateful to them and i would like to thank our sponsors bharat serum who have been Uh, effortlessly doing this concept of bridging bharat so here we come and we are bridging the small states of our country and small cities and we are exploring them and opening them to all the people and they are been very happy to see today shillong and guwahati being there with us and i would like also do apologize technical glitches which occurred in the beginning so please excuse me i was little bit uh, tied up with those technical glitches and hence i had to be there little bit but i thank all of you madam and all of your members who have been present today uh, for this wonderful webinar there are still questions but we have little little time which is there and i would like you all to listen to what i'm trying to say and basically we have this presentation i would like to acknowledge each one of you here this is our video presentation thank you and uh, before we end i would like to say it is truly powerful and liberating to say exactly what you are feeling and to feel truly listen to without judgment and that's what i'm going to end with today and i want the slide to be posted here so that all the people can see this जिंदगी में एक बात तो तय है कि तय कुछ भी नहीं है नमस्कार सुप्रभात मित्रों जीवन का अनुभव तो दृष्टिकोण नजरिए से ही होता है भिन्न भिन्न परिस्थितियों में मन की स्थिति मानसिकता अनुसार अनुभव की प्राप्ति होती है लगातार हंसने से जबड़ा में पीड़ा होती है ज्यादा खाने से बीमारी होती है ज्यादा रोने से नैराश्य आता है हर बात पे क्रोध आने से रिश्तों में दूरी आती है अति विश्राम करने से मन तन निष्क्रिय होके रोगों के लक्षण दिखाते हैं इसीलिए पढ़ना लिखना और काम करना जरूरी है आत्मनिर्भरता वेबिनार भी जरूरी है तभी में संतुलन ही जीवन में विजय होने का समीकरण है मैं प्रार्थना हूं कि हम सभी इस कठिन कार्य को तो हर दिन करते हुए सफल समृद्धि और संतुष्ट हो और इसी के साथ 
मैं फिर मिलूंगा भारत ब्रिजिंग भारत सीरम की और की तरफ से एंड आई वांट टू थैंक साइंस इंटीग्रा एंड द एंटायर टीम टू गेट दिस प्लेटफॉर्म ऑल ओवर इंडिया थैंक यू फिर मिलेंगे गुड आफ्टरनून थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच सर थैंक यू सो मच जवान थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सर